Hi everyone, um, and thank you for joining us today. And welcome to the latest instalment in our Keeping It Real webinar series. I'm Emma Bagshaw, a senior medical writer here at Vita Access, and I'll be hosting the session. For those of you who are regular attendees at our webinars, you might be used to seeing Anna Richards, our commercial lead in the hosting seat. She's recently left to go on maternity leave. She's just had a beautiful baby girl, so I'll be stepping in while she's away. Today we'll be talking about how to successfully implement a digital real world study. This is the second in a pair of webinars focusing on digital real world studies. Um, we presented the first webinar about how to successfully design this type of study last month. If you were unable to join us for that one and you'd like to catch up at some point, you can find it and all our past webinars on the Vite Access website. But don't worry if you did miss that one, we won't be assuming any prior knowledge for today's webinar. In this session, we're going to focus on what happens once you've designed your study, how to successfully execute it in the real world. And we'll be sharing some experiences from studies in rare diseases and oncology. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. Um, I'm joined today by Mark Larkin, our CEO, and Laura Day, Associate Director of Analytics. Mark is the founder and CEO of Vitaxess. He has over 20 years of experience in HUR and real world evidence consulting. Mark founded Vitaxess with the aim of harnessing the power of digital technology to better represent patients' voices in drug development and in market access. Laura is an analytics expert with a background as a medical statistician in clinical research. She provides oversight to the statistical analyses in our studies to ensure meaningful insights can be gained from the data that we gather. Okay, so over the next half an hour or so, we're going to share some considerations um, for what goes into implementing a digital real world study. So, I'll begin with a brief introduction to Vite Access. I'll then hand over to Laura, who will talk about participant engagement. Uh, so what engagement means in a study like this and how to measure it in such a way that you can take action to optimize engagement rates. Laura will then go on to discuss the ins and outs of building and executing a statistical analysis plan for a digital real world study. We'll then hand over to Mark, he'll take you through strategies for effective monitoring of real world studies uh, to help gauge the health of a study on an ongoing basis and uh, to enable you to make adjustments to sort of mitigate any emerging risks. And finally, Mark will discuss how to make the most of your data by building an effective dissemination plan. At the end of the webinar, we'll have a question and answer session, um, so please feel free to submit your questions at any time. You should see a Q&A box in the side panel of the webinar window. Um, any questions that you enter there will go direct to our speakers and they won't be seen by any other audience members, so please feel free to ask away. Okay, let's start with a little bit about us. Vitactus is a patient-centric research organisation specialising in real-world primary data collection. We work closely with our clients to design and execute research projects that put patients and their caregivers first. So that might be a cross-sectional online survey that asks caregivers about their quality of life or a long-term app-based study collecting data from patients about their experiences of living with and managing their conditions. Our key expertise is in these areas that you see on screen. So real-world evidence, analytics, HUR and market access, patient-centered outcomes and localization. Bringing all these functions together enables us to design and run global real world studies that generate reliable and relevant data. To help power our studies, we've developed our own digital research platform and it's called Vitaxis Real. The two key components to this platform. The first is a participant facing data collection tool and the second is a researcher facing research portal. Using the platform, we can easily collect data from participants through their own devices, um, perhaps via an app on a patient's phone or a website that they can access on a computer. Then the research portal allows us to share aggregated data with study sponsors and other approved researchers in close to real time. So they can see really up to date granular data visualizations and have the opportunity to uh, spot trends as they emerge, which is pretty exciting. 
the Vice Texas Real Platform is designed around this modular architecture. Um, so that means we've built a range of digital components that are likely to be of use when running a real world study, such as electronic consent functions, uh, patient reported outcome surveys, or a safety reporting feature for pharmacovigilance requirements. And these can then be customized to meet the needs of a specific study. This modular approach means that your digital data collection and reporting tools are up and running quickly and easily, um, which makes this a fast and efficient way to run a study. So that's enough about us for now. Uh, before I hand you over to our first speaker, Laura, just a reminder that if you'd like to watch that first part of this uh, two part webinar series about designing a real world study, you can do so at any time via uh, the via the Vides Access website. Right, I'll hand over to Laura now to begin our discussion on successful study implementation. Thanks, Emma. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as Emma said, I'm, I'm Laura Day. I'm Associate Director leading the analytics team. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the implementation uh, phase of the study. And the bits I'm going to cover are driving and measuring engagement and building and executing a SAP. And the focus here is going to be on the digital longitudinal studies as they are more complex than just a cross-sectional study, which is far easier to measure by standard metrics. So, for example, that would be the number of completions versus the expected completions just at one time point. And to our knowledge, there's not any established literature about the measurement and engagement of longitudinal studies. Uh, the next slide, please, Emma. So there are two types of main engagement that you can see in real world studies. Uh, the first is attrition, which is leaving the study or being lost to follow up. And the second is persistence. So remaining in the study, but not providing complete data. And that sorry, previous slide still. <laughs> Um, there is crossover between uh, retention and engagement, and both are in play throughout the study. And so retention is keeping the participants in the study, and the engagement part is if they are opening and or completing their surveys, basically just doing what's asked of them. But then there comes a point where you move away from engagement and more into the retention area. So if people stop completing their surveys, you have a window to get them back before it then moves into a retention problem. Next slide, please. So how do we report these engagement statistics? The analytics for, for this kind of reporting should be ongoing and it, it should begin as soon as accrual can usefully be analysed. And the analytics should be based around understanding and being explicit about the analysis data set that you're using. So that should include attrition, which basically means you're always considering the denominator to any statistic that you're presenting. And you need to create a, a heuristic for that attrition, which would be based on the number of administration periods since participant last completed a survey. And that would also that would vary by study due to the, the different context of the disease, the treatment and, and the participants themselves. The analysis and reporting should, should be frequent because it can change quite quickly and as the study's going on. And the final point is that attrition and completion should be reported separately. And the results of that analysis should be connected to pre-planned contingencies for each of those things. Uh, next slide, please. So now moving on to talking about building and executing a SAP. So on the next slide, you will see the key success factors in, in uh, your real world study SAP. And these are timing. So you want the SAP to be completed prior to study launch. Uh, simplicity. So keeping analysis simple in the first instance and accounting for change uh, because real world studies do evolve over time. So just talk a little bit more about each of those. Um, the timing of the SAP, as it says there, sh it should be signed off prior to study launch or as soon as possible afterwards, and certainly before you do any formal data analysis, which is particularly important in real world studies, because uh, it's essential that all study activities are as rigorous as possible, because it's not in that trial environment. And then simplicity, the first uh, analysis plan should generally just comprise, of, uh, comprise descriptive statistics of every item that's collected in the study. 
and then further addendums can then be made to the SAP uh, as hypotheses of interest arise during the course of the study. And of course, the rationale for those would be justified in the SAP amendment fully. And then on accounting for change in real world studies, uh, things can change and evolve very quickly. And the key is to strike that balance between detail and rigor and pragmatism. And we always set out analyses up front for scientific rigor. And in addition to the SAP, we do also, um, we recommend uh, producing the data specifications document, which would include uh, validation range checks, logic checks, so including skip order and missing answer error messages. Uh, and during analysis data set creation, all of those checks would also uh, be done so that the, the data quality is as high as possible. And just wanted to mention about missing data as well at this point. So it's important that the study design minimizes the missing data where, where possible, as I mentioned, the error messages and prompts. Um, but where surveys are, are simply not completed, uh, in this type of study, the missing data have to be assumed missing, not at random, due to the, the design of the study. So we generally don't make any adjustments to account for missing data beyond following the PRO scoring algorithms. And this is where things like rewards are extremely important to maintain engagement and survey completions throughout the course of the study. Then moving on to the next slide, we have got a case study here. So this is one of the studies that we ran. Um, it's in a rare disease, CMT. Uh, the study's been running for almost five years with over 3,000 patients. It's running in the US and EU five countries. So the original stats analysis plan included uh, an interim analysis each year of the study. The first uh, three analyses, interim analyses, were descriptive. And then the fourth one was when we moved into the regression modeling. Uh, so the purpose of the first three was, was to give a cross-sectional look at the data that was being collected. And over those three analyses, obviously more data was coming in, a, a picture was being built up that we could look at each of those time points. And then that was used to inform the hypothesis of interest for the fourth interim analysis of regression modeling. And moving on to the next slide. I will talk in a, in a minute about the um, interim analysis for the regression modeling on that, but just wanted to mention the analytic methods uh, here for real world studies. So by observational studies, by definition, aren't randomized and therefore simple statistical tests are biased. And digital real world studies further complicate that uh, because there's greater and much more varied data collection. And that's why we often use regression based methods. And these methods also, they give us an opportunity to, to make the best use of the data that we have. Moving on to the next slide. Let's just put a very brief basic linear regression example here in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, a linear regression model describes the relationship between a dependent variable and one or more independent variables. If you could just click ahead, Emma, thank you. So the dependent variable is the measured effect and the independent variable is the change in or varying variable or multiple variables. And then, yeah, that's it. There's an example. Um, so very simple example, completely made up. Here, the independent variable is screen brightness. If we vary the brightness and ask half of you to lower it to 40% uh, randomly, so based on your birthday, uh, then the dependent variable, the one that's being measured, is, is the eye test scores. And then you would compare the two. And then moving on to the next slide. The interpretation of this. So the intercept in the model means that on average, people can get halfway down the list for this site, site test. And again, this is completely made up. Uh, with the screen darkening, the site test score decreases. Uh, so that's percentage of lines red. And the negative coefficient represents the decrease there. And then if you look at the p-values, the intercept is significant at almost any level, which is expected because it's the average in the population. And the effect of the screen dark can in is still significant at the 5% level, but it's not quite as strong. And if we were to choose, say, a 1% significance level, the effect wouldn't be significant, but 5% is traditional and generally accepted. And just a little FYI here, when you think about 
significance, there are two forms. There's clinical significance, which can be seen from the coefficient in the models. And that tells us whether the change is, is meaningful, which is not the same as being statistically significant. So if you had a very big data set, for example, you could have very high levels of statistical significance, but a very small coefficient. So the stats result would, would mean nothing from policy or intervention perspective because it's there's no meaningful change clinically. Then moving on to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, we have the interim analysis for, so back onto CMT uh, case study. Uh, and as I said before, this interim analysis um, it came out of producing cross-sectional descriptive analysis in previous uh, interim analyses and also from consult consultant with clinicians on the study. And this here is an example of the BFI fatigue model. So what you can see here is that uh, if the age of diagnosis was zero to 10 years, it actually had a negative effect on the BFI mean global score, which is the, the scale is zero to 10, where 10 represents worse symptoms. So a negative coefficient, which is what you can see here, means that the, the BFI mean global score is shifted down. And the p-value is significant, uh, suggesting that the effect seen in the model is the same as in the real population. Moving on. Just a couple more bits. Uh, one of them is add-on studies. So a couple of examples here of the type of add-on studies that, that you could do. Uh, so qualitative, uh, non-interventional interview, and that was a follow-on from observational longitudinal study collecting patient and caregiver reported outcomes. And then the second example we got here is a cross-sectional study for the caregivers, which was a follow-on from an observational study collecting patient reported outcomes. And the thing that, that really wanted to highlight here was the importance of the informed consent options and the option to consent to being contacted about further research. So that's especially important in rare diseases because you have a very valuable pool of patients there that that you don't want to lose and you want to you know maximize the potential there. Then moving on to the next slide. So the final thing that I wanted to talk about was linkage. So as you can see here, there are lots of opportunities for external linkage with digital real world data. So clinical trials, other registries, future observational studies. That also includes qualitative studies and claims databases. And just to highlight once again, the importance of informed consent, because that's critical for these future data linkages to be possible. And then that's it from me. Moving on to Mark. Thanks very much, Laura. So yeah, I'm going to start talking about some monitoring strategies for um, longitudinal studies. So if you go to the next um, slide, then Emma. Um, if you click through a couple of times, I mean, the, using digital studies, there's really some opportunities to monitor that are perhaps greater than, um, you know, traditional studies. So why would you do that? So it give, we have an opportunity to monitor things in a timely manner. And if things aren't as we expect, or we, we can take action um, to, to remedy them. Um, we can look at recruitment curves, seeing if the participants uh, are recruiting this in a timely manner as we would hope and expect. Uh, which gives some indication of the, the health of the study. And we can also keep an eye on, if this is part of the analysis plan, uh, numbers in subgroups, um, so that we don't come to do our analyses at the end of the study and find out we have insufficient numbers. So we, if, if there are levers that we can uh, tweak in terms of uh, recruitment um, to try and favour some of the, the, the subgroups that have been recruiting poorly, we can try and do that. Next slide then. Oh, sorry, that one. Uh, yeah, and informal subgroup comparisons. Um, yeah, a bit related to that, we can, well, I'll talk a, a little bit about dashboards um, and we can look at the uh, characteristics of some of the subgroups as we go along informally to try and um, have an idea that uh, we're on track for the, for the formal um, analysis that we'll do in the SAP. So there are some challenges here. We were talking about uh, oncology rare diseases. So there are challenges of rare diseases around low um, monitoring with low patient numbers as well. So what we have to do, you know, we're, when we're working on behalf of a sponsor, uh, we need to typically preserve the anonymity of our participants. 
Um, and there's not necessarily one way that we would do that. We would remove PII, but depending on the size of the study, we, we might also need to think about removing patterns from the data that we might share. And um, we might also need to build into the analytics plan some sort of minimum threshold for reporting below which we simply do no reporting. Um, and for, particularly for really low, ultra rare conditions, those things can, can come into play. So those are those worth bearing in mind. Uh, can carry on then. Um, monitoring, uh, as I said, digital studies have some nice opportunities to monitor. Here are some recruitment curves of um, an international a global study that we've been doing. There's a question that we answered in the in the Q&A about uh, can we do uh, multilingual studies? Yes, this is a multilingual study. So this is a study which is global, US, Canada, across Europe and Japan. What you see here is some uh, recruitment curves. Um, of cumulatively of participants by country. And if you just click again, this, um, they're linked actually to the, 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 the country launches were phased. And then we work closely with patient advocacy groups who rose, raised the awareness of the study in their respective countries. And if you plot, as you see there, if you annotate mm -hmm. the graph there, you can see that when there was a a, a, a patient advocacy group webinar to announce the launch of the, the, the study in their country. But oh, you get a nice uptick of recruitment, which is pretty nice to see. But again, so looking at this closely as you go along um, is, is really worthwhile. Look, go again then. Dashboard. So we haven't got time to, if anyone's interested, we can get, uh, please get in touch with us. We'd be ever have to you know, give demos of our, our platform and show you, show you dashboards, which we think are a really nice tool. I haven't got time for that today. So just this is a this is a screenshot one dashboard um, from one of the ongoing studies. Um, and we'd be fans of dashboards. They're a tool to give close to real time access. We'd remove the, we remove the PII, so it's a sort of safe area to, to explore the data, to explore hypotheses. Um, to it's a tool to give this is at the sponsor's discretion to give access to different stakeholders to, to, to the data as well. So maybe not just the sponsor, maybe if there's a scientific advisory board, maybe give access to that group as well, uh, which might include patients, patient advocacy groups, for instance. Um, and with, you know, depending on your technology, as enables us to save cohorts, compare cohorts, export the data, et cetera. So really valuable to, as a means of monitoring almost continuously. Carry on. So what we're doing is we're looking at when we're monitoring, we're looking at activity. So and if you click a couple of times more, Emma, um, we're, 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 we're tracking completions. Oh, sorry, back one. Um, we're tracking completions for uh, relative to what we think should happen, relative to expectations. And we can average that across people and across surveys. And we're also looking at longitudinal performance. So the no tracking numbers of participants who give us longitudinal data. And again, we can make averages across, across people and surveys. We, and click one once more. And just to recap on some terminology then. So if we think about um, and the data we capture aren't just about surveys, but let's just think about surveys, typically PRO instruments there. Administered, that's easy. It's the number of surveys we administer. So that could be administered. What does that mean? Because typically this is decentralized. So that might mean being reminded, it's you'd administer, you'd get receive an email, uh, a push notification, or an SMS saying you know your your survey is ready, is therefore administered to you. As Laura mentioned as well, based on past performance, we can uh, sort of extrapolate to what we think of the expected number of surveys that we 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 might have um, to, that might be completed. Then the completed number is the actual number that we 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 capture and. Just to be clear for PRO instruments, that's the fully completed, right? So if you half complete one, doesn't count. Typically you have to be fully completed. And as, as we've talked about, there's, um, there's uh, this active denominator idea. So the number of uh, the denominator, always, as Laura's mentioned, is very important, but um, it varies depending on if you're talking about the number of active patients, depending on how you define it, or the, sort of the full cohort that may contain, contain the number of patients who are inactive uh, and have been for a, for a considerable amount of time. So if you go to the next slide, there's a little illustration of that. This is a, a, a rare disease study where we had an app update after a certain time 
Um, those who didn't update their app, we can't force people to update um, uh, study apps, by the way, um, in the same way that no, you know, none of your other apps can be, you, you can force people to update. So beyond, before a certain time, um, at a certain point, if they didn't update the app, they couldn't longer, uh, no longer provide any, any new data. So what that meant is a difference in when we looked at the completion rates. So as you see there in this table, got a number of administered, number of completed, but different numbers depending on whether the completion rate is active or um, a, a broader uh, denominator. So, you know, when we, when, if, if you press again, so the, the very nice complete completion rate when you, when you look at all the, uh, the active participants, but a very different picture if you, if you don't consider the activation of the, of the participants. So we carry on, um, and yeah, I mean, look, we, we could we could maybe do another uh, webinar on what it means to be an active participant. That's a really big uh, discussion, and it really depends on the characteristics of um, the study. But to just give give you a little taster, I mean, it might be time based. You might think, well, if someone's not active for a week, I'll call them inactive. But that's different if you've got daily data capture for three months versus data capture once a quarter for five years. So it's important to define what you think, what you mean by active. Okay, carry on. Um, there's another nice little case study for you. Um, we, we wanted to, in, in our CMT, Shark and Mary Tooth study, we were interested in capturing falls uh, and almost falls, which is characteristic of this disease, which is neurodegenerative disease. Um, and if you, what we wanted to do is, is, is capture in an easy way because the literature doesn't contain this, uh, fall when people fall, very simply, when they fall, when they almost fall. Recall, if you did it every, every six months, people, it's not, it's not um, accurate enough when you see your, your neurologist every six months to recall how many times you fell or almost fall. So what do we do? Uh, we put a counter, we've got a study app, and very simply, press here if you, if you um, tap to record a fall or an almost fall. But what happened, um, what we found is that people actually massively over, over complete. We speculated and, and talked to patients and some of that could be by accident. Um, so we, when we looked at the data, we had um, some unfeasibly large numbers of falls. Uh, and of course that's, that creates some credibility questions over mm -hmm. you know, the numbers in the middle. So what do we do? So we, in, in discussion with the, 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 the sponsor the, the clinicians on our advisory board. We, we analyzed in, in a way that was based on no falls, one fall, or, or more than one fall in a particular period. And that was quite useful as it may, it was helpful enough, it was, it was good enough for us to make inferences about the risk of falls with people at home. Um, and um, it also helped us in, yeah, as we say here, engage with clinicians about what what are the suitable or feasible bounds upper bounds for for people falling or almost falling um so um yeah no, i suppose the, the, the advantage of this study is that we have this real-time data it's, that's something you don't find in uh health care professional um uh, consultations so capturing that sort of uh, prospectively was was really valuable and you know a lot more granular data than was were avail available anywhere. It's not in claims data or anything else, but it's pretty it's pretty important to patients. So I'm going to talk about just to check on time. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about dissemination of results. Um, again, we probably do a whole webinar about this, but I'm just going to give you a few pointers based on our our experience. So. Um, here's a sort of summary for you. Um, and this is really about thinking about for a prospective study, you've got lots of data, lots of potential publications, great news. But how do you how do you um, how do you put that in some sort of order? Um, so publication plan, think early about that. Think about the themes um, right as early as the protocol, why you're going to be capturing certain types of data. You must use the data, you know, don't shouldn't be capturing data that you're not going to be using. Um, there may be, for, for a real world evidence study, there may be other form, um, evidence generation strategies that are happening in parallel. So there should be some consistency with the planning for dissemination of results for your real world evidence study as you with, with those other initiatives. Collaboration, very important. 
The sponsor will be the expert on the product, but we might be unge- unearthing really valuable uh, insights from uh, clinicians and from uh, patients and advocacy groups that maybe aren't uh, available elsewhere. So collaborating, getting their input, really useful. Um, and then targeting which conferences, which um, events, publications, etc. That takes a little bit of time and thinking. Um, there, obviously, people want typically the most um, the events with the biggest impact, the global events. Um, depending on the study you have, uh, if it's real world evidence, you might have to have lower impact journals than than, than, than you might wish for. Um, and then might also be requests for uh, dissemination of results at, at a national level as well. I mean, we, we would say that's pretty good news, you know, having having a desire to have data. If you've, you've gone to all the trouble of ge- generating data across a whole, whole load of different countries, if you have data that are suitable for presentation at, at national conferences as well, that's good news. Um, but all of that takes uh, management and, and um and targeting. And then back to hopefully consistently what we've been talking about today, review regularly. If you're doing a long-term study, your your what you're seeing in the data may have an impact on your publication plan. So, you know, it, it shouldn't be carved in stone. It should be a bit of a living document. So review review that, review that regularly. So um that's the sort of perhaps the more traditional side of things, the the, the dissemination results, publication planning, etc. On this slide, we talk about giving another type of dissemination, which is providing participants themselves with feedback. When we talk to participants in our studies, as we do a lot, one of the key things that they say that motivates them for being involved in this type of study that we do is receiving feedback on on how it's going. And we do that in a number of different ways. So um, it should be tailored, of course, to the cohort and study, but some examples are providing feedback within an app, within the study app that they've, that they've um, uh, downloaded, regular study newsletters. Um, we have a nice system, which you see some examples of what we call data nuggets. These are infographics, uh, graphical representations of the data in hopefully easy to understand, uh, digestible format that won't bias ongoing responses. Uh, publications we just talked about, of course, m- many participants or Participants in any cohort will have mixed uh, academic and technical expertise. So journal publications aren't for everyone, but you know many people do read those. And then webinars, you, you saw a, a, a few minutes ago the, the value of webinars around launches, but you know we, we work on studies where patient advocacy groups give annual updates on studies via their annual meeting uh, and webinars. So that's an invaluable way that patients um, have to get feedback on uh, on the results of, that they have contributed to. Um, carry on. So here's a nice example. So look, this is from our study in shock and tooth disease, um, feedback on um, to, to, to patients. Um, and if you co- carry on to the next one, we'll s- fingers crossed the video might work on this if you click on it somewhere. Oh, there you go. So look, as you see here, this is very simple um representation of some of the data that we found hopefully of interest in patient to patients won't bias the results that they are still producing and as you see here it's all localized into their um their own language which is obviously um hugely important and um often a call to action as you know carry on please carry on uh, contributing to this to this study so as you see there multi-language. So if you want to carry on, um, Emma. So patients as co-authors, we're big advocates of this. I mean, you can see on our publications uh, list on our website, um, we've got lots of uh, publications where patients have been uh, co-authors. I'm not going to take you through this in detail, but there's, you know, lots of good guidance to to help you with this as to how patients can be uh, co-authors, essentially helping them and making sure that they contribute meaningfully um to 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 the study but in our experience you know we've had some wonderful interactions with patients um that have really contributed strongly to the publications that we we've generated um so you know as i said we're big advocates of those carry on um you know just 
to prove that there may be um, one of the publications that we have from, from one of our studies with a long list of, of co-authors, including uh, patients and advocates from, from some of the scope countries that we, we were involved with, who have been really um, uh, active uh, parts of the, 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 the study team and the scientific advisory board for this. So, you know, I mentioned the, the, the richness of publications from uh, prospective studies that are possible. This is an ongoing study, but we've had, as you see here, over 15 publications across a whole range of data domains. And we're still, we're still going through this. As, as Laura mentioned, we have interim analyses and you know, each interim analysis offers more opportunities for publication. So really this study is building a picture of the impacts, uh, plural, of um, this disease on patients and caregivers. And you know, disseminating the results is not only important to the sponsor, but in some ways it's part of the contract, perhaps informally, that we have with participants. Why are they getting in, involved in this particularly important rare diseases? They want to help the, the understanding of, of their rare disease, and uh, publications are a key part of that, of course. Carrying on. So some caveats and, uh, and fine print then. Um, if you want to click through these, uh, we tried to br bring some of these together a little bit um, with some, some uh, recommendations for you. Uh, implementation, in the implementation, but also, also thinking back to the design. Scope piloting and scoping, absolutely vital. You know, we, there's lots of choices in real world evidence studies. That points even further to the importance of, of, of piloting and scoping. Um, yeah. Co-creation, big fans as well. Take that does take time, but we we can do our bits of, of making prototypes very quickly, which we think buys us time, invaluable time to uh, engage with people and, and, and get feedback and, and that co-creation. Uh, don't be greedy. That happens in pretty much all studies that we do, because one can ask lots of questions mm -hmm. of patients. This tendency is to try and do that, but actually prioritization is important. If you overburden patients, you get nothing, they will disengage. So be, be, don't be greedy. Um, phasing as well, yeah, relatedly must-haves versus opt-ins, because uh, you can opt-in later, you can add stuff later. So, so again, be cautious and narrow maybe at the start. Um, after that, um, yeah, think monitoring, what are the KPIs for the study? Is it in terms of patient uh, targets, patient recruitment targets, or is it engagement after a certain time point? Think of that. Uh, not it's not just in the SAP. Don't wait till the first interim analysis necessarily to be thinking about study health KPIs. And I suppose globally, engage with stakeholders. Um, doing so does take time, does take some resources, but it de-risks your plan. So a good return on investment on that engagement, we would say. There we are. Emma, I think it's back to you. Yep. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, thanks, Laura, as well. It's now time for the Q&A section of the webinar. So I'll see what questions we've had come in. Um, right. Let's start with this one. Do you require self-report or uploads of digital snippets of EHR to confirm diagnosis? So do we ask participants to self-report or to provide confirmation of their diagnosis in some way? I can take that if you like, Emma. Um, we don't. So it varies. I'm sorry to say it varies all the time, but it varies. So we've done that in some of our studies. We have the capability of doing that in our platform. Whether one wants to do that is an important design question. Um, if you ask for the di upload of a diagnostic letter, it's a bit more a hassle for people. Um, if one wanted to, one could forge a, a diagnostic letter. If you're doing a big uh, study with thousands of participants, if someone uploads those letters, if you're going to say someone's going to check through those letters as well, that creates a sort of a dip, quite a lot of resource requirements. So we've got a system where we can remove certain types of mask, certain types of data. So from a technical perspective, there's a lot that you know we can do pretty much anything you would, li would like, but it's really the questions around that that are, that, that, that are more worth thinking about. So hopefully that answers your question, but the short answer is we can, but whether you should, that's probably a, a better question. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, the next one we've got here is, I'm always interested in dropout rates in digital studies over time. Do we have any summary data about this, like reviews or meta-analyses on the topic? Yes, yeah, so I, I can take that one. Um, 
so I think it it's an area that's a huge interest to us it's it's a huge interest to a lot of people at the moment and what I would say is that we've seen a lot of variability between our studies and we have some suspicions some hypotheses why that might be but a review or a meta-analysis of that is is on our radar and you know we hope to do that that very soon yeah we, we, we have we have just to add to that I don't we haven't seen anything like that elsewhere that, that I suppose would be relevant to the type of studies we we um we're doing if anyone has any suggestions or pointers in that direction would be very interested in that but yeah as Laura said that it is really important we're it's on our on our radar screen okay thank you both uh right next one do we think that real world evidence will attract interest from higher impact journals as the patient involvement movement grows? Yeah, I mean, I, I can speculate on that. I mean, I would hope it, it, it does. And I suppose there's um, an increasing number of um, publications from different stakeholder groups. So HTA bodies, regulators, describing how real world evidence should be generated and reported and used for those different audiences. So I don't think that exists, that, 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 that progress didn't exist a few years ago. So I would suggest that that, that can, is, is supportive of the growing importance of this type of data. So I would, I mean, I'm biased, of course. I would also suggest that journals recognising that would be a logical evolution as well. I mean, they, of course, it goes without saying, but they, they would want the, 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 the data to be as rigorously generated as possible, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, I would hope so. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, let's see if we've got time for any more. OK, if uh, so maybe one for Laura. If you're monitoring a study uh, and you spot a problem that means you decide to make changes to a question, sort of add one in or take one out, how does that affect the SAP and the analysis? Could making changes to the questions, um, trying to fix a problem, actually cause more problems in terms of the analysis? Yeah, so I think that might be another case of it depends. Um, it, you don't want to make changes for the, the sake of making changes to a study, but the whole point of this kind of study is that you can be adaptive and you can update it if you need to. But I mean, the worst thing you could do is is to ignore the problem. If it is a problem to the study, you should always you should always make the change if the change needs to be made. And for the analysis question, both are possible. Uh, it depends on the changes. Uh, the preferred option is probably to merge the old and new data together. So that you have a bigger sample for that question, that item, um, but it's it's very possible to report uh, before and after separately if, if that's what's needed. Okay, thanks, Laura. Hope that answered your question there. Um, right, looking at the time, I think we've probably got time for just one more quick question. So, okay, would it be possible to visit the platform? Um, is there a video? uh yes absolutely um if anyone wants to more info there are some demo videos we have our platform so we would be delighted to uh to help with that of course so if you want to anyone wants to get in contact with us um, afterwards uh we'd be happy to do so great thanks mark um I think that is about all we have time for today. Um, if anybody has further questions, please do feel free to get in touch. Um, you'll find Right Tight Sisters contact details on our final slide. Um, I'd just like to say thanks everyone for taking the time to join us today. And thank you uh, to our speakers, Mark Larkin and Laura Day. Um, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar and we would love to see you at our next one, which is an exciting one about how to actually design the study app for a real world study. Um, so thinking practically about what goes into the app, what considerations do you need to do there in terms of what questions you put to people, accessibility, making it engagement. So it should be a really interesting one. Um, and that's coming up at the end of March. Um, if you're interested in that one, look out for our comms, check out our website and you'll be able to sign up for that. Um, so I think that is 
all from us. I'll leave you there. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.